My name is Stephen Gillen. It was estimated that I stole over $5 million worth of high value goods as the leader of an organized burglary game. This is how crime works. Our burglary gang would always carry some kind of weapons, but that is to control the situation. The emphasis is not to hurt people, but to command dominance without any fuss or unnecessary violence. I was operating in the late 80s, early 90s, all around the greater London area and the home counties. My first introduction to the gang was just people that we hung out with and, you know, grew up with pretty much. Burglary gangs pretty much always know each other already. They may have gone to school together or they know each other's brothers or they would have worked with each other in another form of organised crime. This is the way our gang was formed. I was a leader of a gang of four, sometimes five people. You'd have the lookout guy, who was the eyes, who would drop us off. You'd have the muscle, he would be the brute force. And then you'd have the jack of all trades. He would also bring a lot of information. And then you'd have someone there who was always really savvy with alarms, with sensors. There were a couple of times where people, you know, would be arrested. It's the nature of this game. Many times we would not want to bring anyone else in because we would be able to replay that and execute what had to be done anyway. But on rare uh, occasions, if we needed another body, as it were, there were always a selection of people within our groups. Scouting for properties is a role all by itself. The properties the gang would target, one would be ones that we were sent to with specific information, usually knowing there were high value items in there. Others, there would be surveillance on them, they would be watched. Information could be from a disgruntled employee and just other people even close to the family. I think all this posting uh, and showing of uh, wealth on social media, where people live, what they're doing all the time, is very, very dangerous. It was different back then when we was active, but I know now a lot of really high-end burglary gangs that specifically go, into the, uh, go onto the internet and that's where they get their targeting. Kim Kardashian is a name, professional footballers, they're very susceptible to that happen to them. It was very easy even to pick the time when to go to the properties because they'd be posting saying, I'm at the Oscars or I'm away at, you know, Switzerland for the weekend filming. A burglar decodes a target in a certain specific way. First thing he's looking at is going to be the weakest part, you know, of the building. Houses which are semi-detached, Houses that are on the corner of the road or have a lot of shrubbery would be a target. People going there, you know, in uniform as a postman or a worker or whatever. This is so if anyone's looking out the window or watching or passing in the car, they look like they have every reason to be where they are. A great deterrent, it's not a full deterrent, is that places would have a new alarm. Dogs is another one. When they see obstacles like this, they're more likely to move on to an easier target. Our gang, you'd come aware of a dog and the barking, but look, there have been times it's very easy to get a nice bit of meat, put loads of Valium or whatever in it, and sling it over the fence or put it into the dog's kennel. The best time for, for the gang to, to approach a target really varies, which is why the surveillance and the location are very, very important. Commercials were generally more at night, just because of during the day there'd be a lot of people in these units. Smashing glass is not just noisy, it's very messy. And if you're climbing through glass, then you have a big percentage of leaving DNA blood and all these kind of samples. It wouldn't be our preferred entry point. 
Overpowering or circumventing private security is something a burglary gang would not want to do. They'd look at ways to get around that. In them days for us, security codes in residential properties, you know, would usually have four or five numbers. So there were uh, technologies that we had that could plug into that to uh, release the number, you know, and then you had safes and there was different ways to drill safes or, you know, in some cases, like the old days, people would even blow them, but not so much. We would be looking to do as least work as possible. So it was basically about dismantling the alarm systems, you know, and getting through that first level of protection. We had other, other um, techniques that we used to use, which was a building foam, which we could put into an alarm system that would harden. So the bell wouldn't, wouldn't be able to, to ring, but then we'd have to do the same on the internal alarm system. You know, other ways into a building, you know, it's, it's the understanding of alarms and how they work. It's usually, if it's not sensor, uh, sensor lead, you would know it would be metal on metal for doors. So sometimes we would just chop the whole bottom of the door off and pull that in, uh, uh, the bottom out. The alarms wouldn't trigger and that would give us the valuable time that we would need to get to the internal alarm system and disable it. Our gang wouldn't necessarily target homes or commercial properties with people in them, but sometimes we did. Our burglary gang would always carry some kind of weapons, not heavy weapons like guns, but that is to control the situation. The emphasis is not to hurt people, but to command dominance to get the work done without any fuss or unnecessary violence. People would always uh, comply because we was very professional in our, in our approach. The places people would hide items, usually they're just out there in a master bedroom or in a cupboard or in a jewellery box. A lot of other times they'll be in a safe, sometimes the safe is open. We have found some of this stuff in the most unbelievable places, in the back of cupboards, rolled up in socks, in the back of drawers, even under the bed and the mattress. One of the most uh, successful burglary jobs we done, me and the gang, was a commercial uh, that had a lot of really high-end designer goods. It had alarms, it was um, in central London. It was a very, very busy location. We had been given um, information about this place. On this job, we left two people outside on the road as lookout. So only two of us went in as the main, as the main lead. I was one of them. Once we got over the outer, through the outer doors and into the courtyard, there was only a really, really flimsy, you know, alarm, but we put the foam into the uh, alarm. We started wrapping up the stuff. We had someone out there they reversed the van in and we loaded that van very, very quickly. That was taken then to what we used to call a slaughter. And a slaughter was where the goods would be unloaded and then moved on to the buyer. Getting rid of the proceeds of a burglary is one of the most risky times but sometimes we would be stuck with certain items. I remember once we had a stamp collection, which come out of a state, uh, safe. Because of the rarity and the misprints on some of these stamps, which was what made them valuable in the first place, it was very hard to find a buyer for these. Their great value translated to a much lower price, which we had to take. We had uh, very key influential jewelers in London who would break up the stones, who would weigh the gold, who would be able to move any amount of jewellery on very quickly. We had other people who was in the antiques market. They would act as middlemen. The paintings guys, they was a different market. You know, and I had a couple of people who worked in that area and it was very specialised, you know, and they would usually always go to private collectors. The retail price of 
diamonds or jewels or gold or antiques is greatly diminished by the time it goes to the black market. If you had a 50 grand diamond, you'd more than likely go and get 12, 13 for it. With gold, you'd get a quarter of the price scrap. There were many times I had paintings worth hundreds of thousands. You'd be lucky to get a few thousand for some of these paintings. I think the market in stolen goods for burglary gangs is pretty much the same. There is a tendency now to go for a lot of high performance cars because they can be shipped abroad, replated, and there's a lot of money in this um, to order. The gang always broke down profit four ways, five ways, whoever was involved and depending on how much of a leading role they had in any given job. Some would fund the lifestyle of, of, of drugs and parties and going out. Others, it would be cars and watches or women even. Sometimes the money was definitely used uh, to invest in the next job. Needed equipment or even to pay off someone who was giving us new quality information. Our uh, burglary gang was um, independent. We didn't have to kick money up to anyone else. Everyone was part of a wider, high-level criminal network. In my time, London's underworld, its organised crime circles, were very tight-knit circles, but loosely affiliated. There were some corrupt officials and corrupt police officers who sometimes would want to get damaging paperwork or would target rivals. Due to the crimes I was committing, I ended up in prison. My further sentences related to organised crime, I was given 17 years, which I served as a Category A prisoner. Many people talk about crimes they've done, crimes they missed, other crimes that are out there and can be revisited or done again. It was an education, a university of crime. Sometimes you come across some really you know, clever guys who will tell you about alarms and safes and locks, which, which could be applied. I first met Charles Bronson because of our level of security category within the prison system. Charles Bronson was a larger than life character. He was an amazing storyteller and an artist. He was a very, very funny man. And he could switch at any time. He had to be managed very, very carefully. I never had a problem with him. I think uh, sometimes long sentences are, are a deterrent. It's more about the lifestyle, the upbringing and the conditioning. These people need more opportunity and they need to be helped and given education and the right um, role models. In the UK, sadly, home invasion burglaries have been on a steady increase year by year now. I don't think police in the UK are doing enough to respond to non-violent crimes. In many ways, these are put on a lower tier of um, urgency. And of course, um, alarm systems are so much more sophisticated now. Everywhere is covered by cameras, drones, directional mics, all kinds of different ways of tracking criminals. This has led many criminals to go into cyber crime and more faceless um, areas of crime. I was released from prison from my final sentence, which was possession of a firearm in 2006. So many years had passed, 12 years, so the members of the burglary gang from the old days had dispersed. It's not conducive to having a family life. Everyone around you suffers, and I knew I needed to change my life, but everyone around me was either dead or in prison. And I went on to, to work real, honest, manual labour. Within 18 months, I went from labourer to supervisor to running my own contracts to starting my own business. I'm a CEO, co-founder of Raw Media Creative Studios, which is a brand development, TV and film digital agency. I 
I was born in England, but as a six month year old child was taken to Belfast uh, and left there in the middle of the war over there. It was a normal occurrence to hear the bombs and guns. I was brought up in an environment of fear, constant violence. My surrogate mother died of cancer when I was nine years old. So I was going back to England and London, which was alien to me. I had a succession of children's homes and foster homes where the basic road for me was to survive. Some of them was quite brutal, but there was a lot of learning from the older ones above me about what to do. And that was the start of the grooming of crime. I'd have guns and the really serious violence around me from the ages of 15, 16. I was exposed to that very quickly. From that point on, it was, it was very much a grooming thing from the older ones. They saw, here's one we can manipulate, here's one who can be sent out there, you know, here's one who I see myself in that's going to be useful to us. And so it translates up the ladder.